All right, it is just 11 o'clock. So I will talk a little slowly while people are joining in. Um, there is a chat at the bottom where you can ask questions if you have them throughout. Uh, there are a few sections throughout this talk, so I will try and uh, go through a full section and then answer questions um, in between each one as we have time. Um, and certainly anything I don't get to, we will cover at the end. So, uh, Thank you all for joining. My name is Seth Wiesman. I am a solutions architect with Ververica. Uh, we are the company founded by the original creators of Apache Flink, formerly Data Artisans. Um, and this is a webinar on deep diving on Apache Flink states. So before we get into any of that, I uh, just want to let you know that Flink Forward Europe is coming up. It's going to be in Berlin October 7th through the 9th and early bird registration is open. So if you're looking to join, uh, it's a great time to get a ticket. I hope to see you there. So today we are going to talk about state and particularly state backends, but really everything pertaining to it. Uh, we'll start with a quick refresher on serialization, uh, then spend a lot of time talking about the different state backends, uh, how they actually work under the hood, uh, and when you may choose one over the other. A little bit on tech checkpoint tuning as long as schema migration, which is a, a newer feature that Flink supports. And then very quickly look at some of the upcoming features that are going to be in 1.9 and future releases. So serializers. Uh, this is going to be a quick overview. Um, I have another webinar that you can watch on a resources page called Debugging and Troubleshooting that goes into much more depth on serialization. But just so you're aware, a Flink serialization system is called Type Information. And it uh, natively supports a wide variety of types. So all the primitive types in the Java type system, a number from Java time, uh, tuples, Scala case classes, POJOs, Avro, uh, most of the things that you are probably using today. Uh, but in any case, if something is not supported, we do have the ability to fall back to a generic cryo-based serializer. Uh, we have done some benchmarking of these serializers using the uh, complex class on the right. And what we have found is that our serializers outperform Cryo uh, fairly significantly. And having the right serializer is typically the best way to get the most performance out of your system. Of course, uh, benchmark your own system, everything uh, is relative. But in general, if we can stay away from Cryo, if we can use POJO and tuple serializers or something like Avro, uh, we're gonna get pretty good performance. And using those is going to unlock a number of features that we'll talk about towards the end of this webinar. Um, if you want to register a custom serializer, so you have a custom cryo serializer, you can do that in the execution config. And so we can specify either the class or an actual instance if you need to parameterize it in some way. And if you want to write a custom type information for your class, you can use the type information annotation to, so that Flink knows, uh, oh, that's the one I'm going to use. Do not derive my own. So even though my tuple over here is a valid POJO class uh, and would derive correctly with the POJO serializer, we've decided, you know what, we want to write our own. And that's okay. Flink is going to respect that. So. That was a quick whirlwind tour of serializers, but now let's talk about state backends. Uh, when we're talking about state backends, what we're really talking about is where memory is going to live during the execution of our application. And so we have our task manager process with some data on the Java heap and some off heap or using native memory. And we can break down our state usage into roughly four categories. There is the Flink framework itself, network buffers, our timer state, and our keyed state. And the relative size of each of those is roughly as shown. So the Flink framework is, of course, written in Java, and so it's always going to be on the Java heap, but it's fairly tiny. And network buffers are always off heap. Uh, we use Netty to implement our network uh, layer, which is yeah, always off heap. 
So the question is, where are we going to put timers in keyed state, which are typically going to be 90, 95% of our uh, memory usage throughout our application? Well, Flink offers two state backends out of the box. One is based on Java heap objects, and one based off of RocksDB. And the big choice between these two is really a choice between, do we want to keep our data on Java heap, or the ability to spill to disk? So the heap keyed state backend, our state is going to live as Java objects on the heap, um, and it's organized as a chain hash table of key to state. And so this is really just a, a key value map. Uh, it's like Java hash map, although a little more uh, optimized. And so we'll have one hash table per registered state, and we're going to support asynchronous state snapshots, which are very important. Um, and data is serialized and deserialized only during state snapshot restore, which gives us very high performance. Um, all of our serialization is happening off of the main execution thread. And so because of that, we're going to get the absolute highest performance. When you read a state out of value state in, using keep keyed state backend, right, we're just returning a pointer to an object already on the Java heap. You cannot get more performant than that. But we're storing a lot of data on the heap, and that means we are going to be affected by garbage collection overhead and pauses. Uh, and this state backend does not currently support incremental checkpointing. So you're always going to be snapshotting the entire state on every checkpoint. However, in practice, this isn't typically that big of an issue because the key, key state backend is used with smaller state-sized applications. And so if you're checkpointing you know, five gigabytes across three task managers, it's not a huge performance burden. Um, it does have the highest memory overhead of representation, and we'll dig into what that means in just a moment. And our state size is limited by available heap memory. So only what we can support inside of our RAM. So when I say it has the highest overhead of representation, what does that mean? What does this actually look like under the hood? So that this hash table is organized as a series of hash buckets, which is just an array of objects that are either four or eight bytes per slot, depending on the JVM architecture you're using, 32 or 64 bit. And the load factor stays under 75% using incremental rehashing. And so inside of each of these objects, we're going to store seven items. There are four references to Java objects, so the key, the namespace, where your namespace adds extra information about the key. So for example, when using windowing, you have the key, but also it's in the one o'clock window. And that window is the namespace. When using a process function, you're always just in the default namespace. And this is something that lives under the hood. You don't ever have to think about your namespace, but it does have to be stored. So the key, the namespace, uh, along with the actual state itself, and a pointer to the next entry. Um, those objects have object overheads, but some of the things they're pointing to may be shared because these are generic objects, you can do whatever you like. It also stores three ints, which are uh, versions and some hashed uh, hash codes. So that's four to eight bytes for each pointer, times four, depending on the JVM architecture, times plus three more ints, along with some object overhead. Um, that's a lot of memory per entry before we even start to talk about the uh, actual data stored in our key or state. So there's a higher overhead here. Um, and, but it does support incremental snapshotting, which is very important, meaning that we can take the snapshot or our checkpoint can occur while we continue processing data. This is not a stop the world checkpoint. What we do is copy the hash bucket and the pointers to each entry. And then if a new item is entered, a new key that does not conflict, there is zero overhead to that uh, entry. But if we make a change to something that lit was already in our table, it is going to trigger a deep copy of that entry, but only as much as is required because type information is able to specify if something is immutable and immutable objects do not need to be uh, performed deep copies. Um, and so yeah, how much is uh, copied depends on what was modified and whether or not it's immutable. 
Uh, in the worst case, we could end up copying the entire table if we manage to touch every key during the lifetime of this checkpoint. But in practice, that is incredibly uncommon uh, and not something I would worry about in the normal case. So when we want to tune our state backend, there are a couple things we may want to consider. Uh, choosing text serialized with efficient copy methods because the copy is the only part of the serializer that is going to live in our per record code path. Right? As we make changes, we're going to need to uh, handle that uh, uh, copy to our snapshot table, but the actual serialization into our checkpoint directory happens on background threads. We want to flag things as immutable wherever possible to avoid copying completely. And also think about flattening our objects. So you can flatten POJOs to avoid deep objects. Uh, that removes object overhead along with following references, which makes us a little more cache friendly. Of course, being on the JVM, we need to consider our garbage collection choices and tuning. Uh, this is going to uh, require some work on your part to determine what makes the most sense for your application. Uh, but Choosing but playing around with these settings can lead to some pretty significant uh, performance improvements. And we may also consider scaling out the number of task managers per node. So if you have a, uh, a machine with four cores on it, instead of running one task manager with four slots, we may run two task managers with two slots, or even four with one slot each. In this way, we have multiple JVMs, right? Because each task manager is its own JVM process. And so they each get their own garbage collector. And these things are not going to, uh, uh, one task slot cannot slow down another. The other uh, state backend choice that we have is RocksDB, which state lives as serialized byte strings and off heap memory and on local disk. So RocksDB is a very performant key value store that was developed by Facebook and open source. Uh, and we leverage it uh, very extensively. So when you're using the RockCD key state backend, we are just putting data into a off-heap RockCDB instance. So inside of RockCDB, we have one column family per registered state, where a column family is roughly equivalent to a table. So one table per value state. And key value is stored and organized using a log structured merge tree, which is a very efficient uh, data structure for doing incremental changes uh, to data. Where keys are serialized of bytes of key group, key, and namespace. So uh, key and namespace we touched on before, the key is what you put in your key by, the namespace uh, adds some extra information, and the key group is the routing key. So it says when running at parallelism of 10 and I have this key, what task manager do I want to route it to? that is uh, handled using the key group. Uh, one of the nice properties of a log structure merge tree is that it naturally supports multi-version concurrency. And so we are going to get asynchronous snapshotting uh, just out of the box, along with incremental checkpoints. Uh, the downside is the data is serialized and deserialized on every read and update. And in practice, this means our type serializer does live in the per record code path. And so uh, it is going to be the uh, is going to be reflected in our uh, our throughput. Excuse me. So the good news is when using RocksDB, we are not affected by garbage collection because all of our data is living off heap. Um, it has a very low overhead of representation. So if you imagine I have a a point class with two integers x and y. When using the heap state backend, I need to store object overheads and pointers and all of these things, along with just serializing the eight bytes of my two ints. But when using RocksDB, those two ints, the real information that we care about, is all that is being stored. And so in practice, uh, it's not just that we're scaling up based on disk versus memory, but that we can actually pack more information into um, the same number of bytes. And of course, the best news, we are now limited by local disk space. So as opposed to scaling in terms of gigabytes, we have users that have terabytes and terabytes of state inside of a single Flink application. 
Uh, however, to be certain, there are some downsides. Uh, there is much lower performance. So compared to the heap state backend, it is roughly an order of magnitude slower. Although that order of magnitude is uh, measured in terms of nanoseconds. So we're still very fast, but not at the same uh, relative speed. When we look inside of RocksDB, um, and this is all off heap, uh, there are a number of data structures that exist. So we have what are called mem tables, and these are our log structure merge trees, right? These are the in-memory data structures where data gets written to. And data is always written into the active mem table. Because RocksDB and state backends in general are only used to store local state, they are not used for fault tolerance, right? That comes from checkpoints and save points. We, are, we uh, unconditionally disable the write ahead log. We will ensure that all data is properly flushed before taking a checkpoint or save point. So when a mem table becomes full, it switches to a read only mem table. So it's still going to sit in memory. And then occasionally, background threads will flush that to disk. And those on disk files are called SST files. Uh, those files are then uh, periodically merged and compacted into uh, to remove duplicates. Because with the log structure merge tree, we are always performing appends, right? When we delete a value, really all we're doing is inserting a delete record that will eventually be compacted down. So we have all of this infrastructure per each column family or each table or each registered state. So this may be one value state inside of a process function. With all of this replicated for the second value state inside of that same process function. So when we have a read path now, so we've inserted some data, we're going to start by searching the active mem tables and read only mem tables and stay in memory. Um, this is going to be uh, incredibly efficient because we're only ever looking for the most recent entry into our state backend. We can also add a read-only block cache that can help uh, uh, limit the number of files that we actually have to uh, look at when, when performing a read. And in the worst case, we will actually go to disk. And so what this means is even though we talk about RocksDB as being the on-disk state backend, it's the one that can spill to disk gratefully gracefully. In practice, most of your per record execution, right, the hot code path within Flink is going to stay in memory, but just off JVM heap. So when we want to uh, look at where data is being used inside of RocksDB, uh, some things we may consider tuning are the block cache size. So that is just the size of the block cache. The bigger you make it, the less often you have to uh, actually read a file off disk. But at the same time, it takes up memory. It means that we get less uh, mem tables, for instance. And so it may be spilling to disk more often. Uh, we also get the write buffer size, which is the max size of a single mem table. So the size of a mem table before it becomes final and eventually written to disk. We can also uh, set the number of mem tables that we allow in memory before flushing to disk. So how many read-only mem tables are we going to allow? Optionally, we can add indexes and bloom filters to uh, add an extra boost of performance to our application. But uh, this is just going to depend on the memory that you have available. The bloom filters especially uh, can take up several gigabytes. And finally, we want to look at our table cache, which caches open file descriptors to SST files. And the default is set to an unlimited number. And so depending on the operating system you're using, uh, you may need to uh, pay attention to this value. So uh, performance tuning of RocksDB is a whole beast. There is a tuning guide on the uh, GitHub page inside of the wiki. But, Excuse me. In general, we're tuning between write, ampli write amplification, read amplification, and space amplification. Choose two. So, do we want to do more writes? Have to do more reads? Uh, 
or have to uh, save space or uh, have to use more space. And so for instance, we could choose that we are going to increase our write amplification. We're going to do more compaction. We're going to do more on disk writes. But in return, our reads are going to be more performance. And so if we have a very read heavy uh, flink job, this may be a great tuning choice to make. Uh, if we're running with terabytes and terabytes, we're probably optimizing for space amplification. Some general performance considerations when looking at uh, RocksDB is we want to use efficient type serializers and serialization formats. As I mentioned, the type serializer now lives in the per record code pack, and it is going to be the biggest bottleneck and throughput of our application. We also want to look at decomposing user code objects. So instead of having a value state of a list, we choose a list state instead. And the same goes for maps. Instead of a value state of a map, we may choose a map state. The reason being, we can take more efficient, uh, we can be more efficient in how often we serialize and deserialize our data. So for instance, with a map state, when you read a key out of a map state, it does not deserialize the whole map. We're only going to deserialize the single value that we're interested in. And if you have a map with several gigabytes, as I have seen in production, you don't want to be serializing that on every read. Also look at using the correct configuration for your hardware setup. So out of the box, uh, Flink provides a number of very sensible defaults under RocksDB options. So high memory, spinning disks, <coughs> excuse me, solid state drives, all the common setups are there. And in general, if you can pick the one that most closely matches your hardware, you're going to see very significant performance improvements, and that is the most tuning that most users need to perform. And then also think about your file system. So ideally, we're looking for uh, our working directory to be fast, local, uh, preferably SSD. It could even be uh, mounted to in-memory if you have uh, a lot of uh, RAM available on your machine. Uh, what we don't want is something like EBS, right, or a mounted volume. The reason is that, again, we are not using RocksDB as a way of being fault tolerant. We're using it for persistence. Checkpoints and safe points uh, give us fault tolerance. And so if you have a network sitting between you and your state backend, you are going to get very bursty, inconsistent performance. Our data may, our RocksDB is gonna do a lot of stuff in memory, it's gonna seem very performance, and then on a checkpoint, Flink forces RocksDB to flush all data to disk, and suddenly you may have a large number of task managers all trying to flush gigabytes and gigabytes of data over network all at the same time and it's going to cause a whole host of problems. So we want, even if running inside of Kubernetes or a Dockerized environment, we want to use local disk. So that is the core of state backups, right? And so that is where all of our keyed state is stored, all of the state that you manually uh, look at on a day-to-day -day basis. But beyond that, we also have timer services. So when you register a timer, it is also stored as part of your state. And historically, Flink has used uh, heap-based timers. So we'll have a binary heap of timers stored in an array, and they store a number of references. So we have a key and, again, our namespace, the timestamp itself, along with its current array index, where key and namespace are still just Java objects, and so there may be some shared state between them. And this gives very good uh, peak, pull, and insert, which are the typical operations we're going to perform. Get us the next timer, uh, reconfigure our binary heap, insert a new timer, but it has uh, ill-performing delete and contains. So we've added a second a uh, map on top of this that stores a map of timers to timers that allows for fast deduplication and deletes. 
And so with this, we get also performance deletes and contains. Uh, when snapshotting heap-based timers, uh, we are doing the same thing as we did in the heap state backend. Uh, we're copying just references to them. However, uh, snapshots are, or timers are immutable, so we get uh, the best performance uh, guaranteed. Uh, before moving on, one thing that is really important with timers is that we store one timer per timestamp regardless of the number of keys associated with it. So one of the biggest performance bottlenecks that we see are people setting timers on millisecond granularity when they don't really need that for their application. And they're doing this, they're creating one timer for each key for each millisecond. But if you simply round to the nearest second, right, and you have 100 keys all register timers for that same second, we are only going to register a single key. And in that way, we can reduce the number of timers by a factor of just 1,000 by removing millisecond granularity. Um, and so keeping that in mind can add a huge, huge performance improvement and can reduce the amount of uh, heat memory used inside of our application. Uh, recently, we added RocksDB-based timers, and so we get to spill to disk. And if you absolutely have to have millisecond granularity in your timers, this is probably what you want. Otherwise, you're just not gonna be able to scale your application. And so these are uh, lexicographically ordered byte sequences, and we store only keys inside of RocksDB. There are no values. So the timestamp itself is actually embedded in the key. And they're stored in terms of key groups, timestamps, and the actual key itself we wanna fire up. Uh, but of course, reading to disk is not performance, and if you're running processing uh, time timers, that could add a significant lag uh, between reading to disk and that timer actually firing. And so we have key group queues that cache the first K timers in memory. And so the most, uh, the timers that are going to fire uh, uh, next are always going to be in memory, and so we can get pretty good performance that way. The same performances if we were using keep key state backups. So what all of that means all put together is that there are three basic task manager layouts, right? We can either store everything on our JVM and be very fast. Uh, we can store everything on RocksDB and get a lot of scale outs. Or we can have some combination of the two, such as storing our timers on the heap and storing our states on the keyed state backend, on disk, excuse me. So we have our data, uh, we have our state backend, which gives us persistence, but now we need our fault tolerance, and this comes out of checkpointing. And let's look at what the difference between full and incremental checkpoints mean in practice. So when we have a full checkpoint, that means that every time a checkpoint occurs, all data, that is currently stored in all of the state backends across all task managers is going to be copied to some uh, DFS, S3, HDFS, what have you. And then when our application fails, for whatever reason, we simply restore the state of the most recent checkpoint and continue processing. Because when we failed after taking checkpoint three, we could just reload that data as it had all the relevant information to start reprocessing. Uh, so when performing a full checkpoint, we are going to iterate and write out the full database stack snapshots as a stream to stable storage. And so when it comes time to restore, we simply need to reinsert all of that data into our state backends and continue processing. One of the nice properties of this is that each checkpoint is completely self-contained and the size of our uh, checkpoint is going to be proportional to the size of the full state of our application. So it's very easy to reason about and manage. Um, optionally, we can add some snappy compression if we're running with very large state and want to be uh, kind to our uh, HDFS team. But maybe we have very large state, right? We're running a terabyte of state inside of our application. Checkpointing that out on a regular basis is not going to be performance. 
so we can use incremental checkpoints, which are currently only available when using RocksDB. And so the very first checkpoint that occurs is going to, of course, have to uh, write out everything because it's the first one. But our second checkpoint, checkpoint two, will only need to output a diff, right? What has changed since the previous one with pointers to checkpoint one saying, I build on top of this. Uh, checkpoint three is then going to do the same. So we're going to get very performant checkpointing. We're going to output the minimum amount of data possible. But on a restore, it means that we are going to have to reread all three checkpoints and reinsert that data. So we are getting some performance in what is the happy path of just regularly checkpointing our data, but losing some performance when restoring from a failure. Hopefully, of course, failures are intermittent and not very common, and so this is a fine uh, price to pay. Uh, one of the really nice things about incremental checkpoints with RocksDB is that we actually get them for free. So uh, SST files get compacted down, and that's all they are. All we have to do when checkpointing, uh, incremental checkpoints, is write out the new SST files that have been written since the previous checkpoints. Um, and so really our trade-off here is that we are getting faster checkpoints for slow recovery. Um, and the creation is only going to copy deltas to stable storage. We are getting some write amplification because uh, we need to output potentially some duplicate amount of data that is stored in these SST files as they are compacted on disk. But because we have compaction, uh, we are going to be able to prune checkpoint history. And this means that our checkpoints are not going to uh, tie themselves back to the beginning of time. Typically, any given checkpoint only references the previous three to five. Uh, the sum of all the increments that we do need to read from stable storage can be larger than the full state size, uh, which may be a performance consideration to conserve. But when restoring, there is no rebuild necessary. We've written out, we've simply copied RocksDB SST files. And so when we restore, we'll just copy the files back to local disk and then reopen RocksDB using those files. Uh, it's a pretty, so we've traded some performance on copying more files, but the restore itself doesn't require any inserts. And so it's a fairly good trade-off. Um, SST files are snappy compressed by default. So we're getting that extra bit of performance. So that gets us through uh, state backends, right? So we have our data in that state backend. And one of the really new exciting features that's come out of Flink in the recent release is schema migration. So let's talk about the anatomy of a typical uh, upgrade of our application. We've got something running in production. It's going great, but you got this new requirement from your product team. We need to add a new field to the data that's stored in state. And so we make our code change, but our state is valuable. Like a database, you don't want to simply throw it away when making a user code change. We want to carry it over across releases. And so we're going to have our Flink user code that is uh, using some local state backend, Heap or RocksDB, and is performing local reads and writes that manipulate that state. And when it comes time to make a change, we're going to take a snapshot, right? A manually triggered checkpoint that write it to persistent storage. We can then go and upgrade our application, so deploy a new version of our code that is going to restore from that state backend, right? So we're going to reload that save point into our state backend and continue processing. What's really exciting is in the latest features, we now have full support for schema migrations for a number of types. So for instance, say you're using Avro, you are storing an Avro type in state, and you make an Avro compliant schema change, we can now support that in Flink, and your state backend is going to migrate similarly to if you performed a schema migration inside of a database. So right now, out of the box, we support uh, Avro schema migrations, along with POJOs and tuples, which have basic migration semantics of adding and removing fields. If you write a custom uh, type information class for your 
object, you can encode your own schema migration semantics. And so if you have a custom complex type and you want to support schema migration, it's a great way to go. Uh, and finally, we have some really exciting upcoming features uh, coming in Flink. So uh, we are getting a brand new state backend. Uh, the big trade-off that we were discussing during this entire webinar was on memory versus in memory versus on disk, right? Performance versus scale. In this new state backend, uh, I don't I don't know that we've settled on a name yet, but it is going to be an in memory state backend that can gracefully spill to disk. And so in this way, you're going to get the best of both worlds. Uh, when you read an object out of uh, state, it's simply returning a pointer to something that is almost certainly on the heap state backend. But when you hit some threshold, we're going to gracefully spill to disk and we're going to get all the scaling capabilities of RocksDB. Another is that we're adding a unified save point binary format. So currently, the save point format, the actual bytes that get written to uh, persistent storage, uh, are state backend specific. And that means that you cannot change your state backend uh, once you have deployed something to production, which is obviously uh, not acceptable in a lot of use cases. It means you have to be cognizant of what your state size is going to be before you've ever deployed. And so by adding a unified binary format, we're going to allow users to migrate between state backends as their business requirements change. And uh, in 1.9, we're adding a state processor API. This was previously called a save point connector. And this means we're adding the ability for Flink to actually read and write save points using a batch processor. So some of the neat use cases for that are we can troubleshoot our jobs by reading our state and doing some introspection. Uh, we can make breaking schema migration changes and we can bootstrap state for new applications. So say we're tracking the clicks for a particular uh, per user from the beginning of time and we have all this historical data living on S3. We can now uh, take that data, crunch the numbers, get the initial values for each user and then write a brand new save point that we can use uh, when restoring, when starting our application for the very first time. So thank you all so much for joining today. Um, there is a chat at the bottom if you have any questions. Uh, we have uh, about 10 minutes remaining in this webinar and I'm happy to uh, answer them. Okay, so um, let's go through the list. So uh, starting with, uh, talk a little bit about how Flink leverages Bloom filters inside of RocksDB. Yes, so uh, RocksDB under the hood uses what is called a log structured merge tree. And that means that whenever you make a change, so it's an insert, a delete, an update, it is always just an append into this data structure. Uh, it is essentially a highly optimized queue. Think something like Kafka. If you've ever used entity-based entity compaction in Kafka, uh, it's very similar. And what that means is when you want to do a query, so I want to read the current value for this key, the latest value could be in any number of, uh, of mem tables and potentially it's in an SST file on disk. And when I wanna do this, uh, when I wanna do this read, right, when I wanna uh, read a value out, I need to know which mem tables and SST files to look in. And Bloom filters uh, are going to add a cache of what keys are in each data structure. And so when performing this read, we can simply 
uh, check the uh, Bloom filter and say, do I actually have to open this file and read it? Uh, or do I have to actually traverse this data structure and look for this value? Uh, and so in that way, you can typically only look at, say, what is the most recent, okay, I need to look at just this uh, mem table in memory data structure and read the value, as opposed to opening a file on disk. Uh, did you say memory state backend supports incremental checkpoints or no? No, currently it does not. Um, that is something that is open on the roadmap right now. However, in practice, uh, when using the memory state backend, you have fairly small state size, right? It's uh, at max a handful of gigabytes across your entire cluster. And so in practice, not having uh, incremental checkpoints has not been the biggest uh, burden, which is why it has not been uh, so highly prioritized. Um, and if you have no state in operators in a workflow, uh, then is the impact that you reprocess everything that you'd have persisted by syncs? If so, so if your latency was one second, then that would be a delay of having to reprocess the data. Yes, I believe so. So, I mean, even if you have no state in your application, there's typically some you know, operator state that's being stored just to manage, say, Kafka offsets or um, on the reader or transactions on your writer. Uh, however, those, the full operator state of your application uh, can almost certainly be in the order of megabytes, right? It's a couple of offsets, it's a couple of transaction keys. Um, but you can certainly run Flink without any state. Um, when you restore, it is just going to do a best effort basis. So however you configure it, maybe you say, just always start by reading the most recent uh, data off of Kafka. And when you do your writes, you're simply uh, making a best effort basis to write it out. That's certainly uh, a feasible. Yes, uh, uh, it's used to determine where the mem table is, or which key is in which mem table. Are there any other uh, questions in the chat? Um, this will this webinar will be posted um, on our YouTube channel and on our resources page on Ververica. And if there isn't anything else, um, we are just about at the end. So thank you all so much for joining today. Um, hopefully, uh, please come to Flink Forward. Uh, it's going to be a good time. And uh, thank you. Bye.